Awesome. All right. So today we move into absolute values, which is a pretty short section of the book. We're wrapping up chapter one. We're kind of on these um, auxiliary sections of chapter one. So like we're going to do absolute value today and then something called inverse functions tomorrow. And then we will be done with chapter one. So pretty much if you had to sum chapter one up into one word, what would that word be? I, yeah, I think so. <clears throat> and then kind of all the outcroppings of what they are, like that homework question with the board, where you can plug a function into a function, um, looking at a graph and functioning, looking at a table and functioning. Uh, what else have we done? What else have we done as it relates to a function? Oh, transforming functions. So how does a, how does a function change? when you add n numbers to it, or other functions to it, and add two together. Um, domain and range of a function, what are all the possible inputs? What does that make all the outputs? Not what are all the possible outputs, but what do those inputs then turn the output set into? Um, and then today we're just looking at an odd specific case of one type of function, which kind of parallels the piecewise thing that we learned at one point, but also has its own little quirks that go with it. Um, can you see that, or I might turn the lights off? Yeah, it's just dark outside, so it will also be dark in here. Is that better? Except for your papers? Lights? No lights. Ah, oh, everybody's just gonna fall asleep on a rainy day. Um, I, need, I wish I could just do like one light, a lamp. I need to get a lamp. All right, remind me. Somebody remind me on group me. Get a lamp tonight from my house. That'd be great. A little lamp in the corner. Maybe like one of those three ones, so it's like a point them in different directions. Thank you. Full of them. All right. So we did learn about absolute, or we learned about not absolute value, except we did say on the stuff you need to know on day one, it was one of the graphs, right? And we are we and we've graphed it a couple times. What does the graph look like? Just real fast, like that, perfectly. Yep. And so the, here's the what the graph is. It's you took what was, and I think this is important to note. You took what was inside, right? And what did you do to it? You took what was inside of the absolute value. You didn't take just the x. You took the whole inside. And what did you do to the inside? It, you, for the top one, it's, it's left alone, right? Which is kind of cool. It's like, oh, we left it alone if bigger than 0. And for the bottom one, what did we do? We flipped the sign, if it was negative, to make it always positive. I just like this thought that, hey, we're not doing it to just the x. Don't just throw it next to the x when you see the x inside of it. If it's a really ugly thing on the inside, we're taking the whole argument and flipping it. Because the whole argument is your final number that you're going to have to go bracket, absolute value, turn it into positive. So you take that whole inside argument. I know that's what's happening here, but sometimes the x just gets confusing when you break it down. Yeah. Right? Negative x minus 5 is what you're saying? Yeah. Um, x plus 5, depending on what x plus 5 turns into, like that condition also depends on where you are on the x. It might just be left alone, but yeah, if you were to flip it, you flip the inside. Okay. Um, the wording of this is a little confusing, but this is like the practical, what does this look like? So let's say... If you score within 20 of 80, you pass. It's a confusing way to say it, but they're saying what we all know, kind of. Uh, what passes? What grades pass? 80 passes? Yeah. What else passes? What definitely passes in our world? 100 definitely passes, right? 60. 60, but it's 20 and 80, right? So 60 feels like it passes too, right? So basically, I feel like this is our... 
Oh yeah, but this not in this problem. <laughs> I don't know. That's it's the problem. I didn't make up the problem. I just copied it from the book. Okay. So that's kind of the goal. Is like, hey, 60, 80, 100. Th those 40 numbers pass somehow. Don't. Who cares whether they pass at this school or not? Um. So write this as a distance from 80 using absolute value. So how can we say go either way as a distance from 80 using absolute value? The biggest hint is it's probably going to include uh, both of these numbers in some form or fashion. Um, so let's just try some stuff. We know there's going to be an absolute value because of the name of the section. <laughs> I don't know. I uh, I'll be honest with you. We're gonna have to play around with some stuff. I don't know. I don't remember perfectly the answer from a long time ago. We're just gonna have to see what gets us our perfect answer. So. What do we, what, anybody have any thoughts on what we could throw into the absolute value just to see? Minus x minus 80. Your grade, if you subtract it from 80, so if you do x minus 80, and you want that to be bigger than or equal to, <gasps> wait, or less than or equal to 20. So if you make 100 right there, what? Ooh, yeah, but what if you, if you made a 60? Is it 60? No, well, it still works. Yeah, it's going to, and that would end up saying true, good. So this is the condition for passing right there. Now here's the thought that I just had, and I didn't even do last year when we did this, is could you flip the 80 and the 20? If you make 100 and you subtract 20, 80. If you make a 60 and you subtract, yeah, you're right, you can't. Huh. Good call. OK. So this is just a conditional statement, which is kind of what absolute values are, right? Conditional, you don't need to know this, but this is a conditional statement for what? As a student, as a student, this is your condition for, yeah. I don't know what's going on here. Conditional statement, no, not at all what I was trying to do, for passing. You could put a big if right in front of it. If the absolute value of your score minus 80 is bigger than or equal to is less than or equal to 20. You did it. I don't know. That's just a harder way to say get a 60 or up. But hey, we're learning. I'm learning too. That's the graph. You've already said that today. Heck yeah. Here's some fun them doing what we learned yesterday to the graph. Watch this. I'm going to zoom in real quick so we can't cheat. Well, I guess you can look at your paper. Don't look at your paper. Look up. What are the shifts as a review, short review session? What are the shifts that they're applying? To the, right oh. to the right three? Okay, hang on, let me change colors. What about the four? Up four. And then this is the tricky one, obviously. Uh, green, hang on. What about the two? This is hard. It's vertical for sure because it's on the, okay, we're cool with that. And now we have to think if it's vertical and it's on the outside, then it's what's expected. So what would you think a two would do to your problem? Yeah. Or I like to say taller when it's vertical, but you don't have to. Um, you can say vertical stretch. But if you're thinking about it in terms of I'm a person, I got twice as tall. This, you took, you p grabbed two points, zero and some other point. And you made it twice as tall, which is probably what they did. Let's go check. So you're, uh, we're saying vertical stretch times two is the words. Let's watch and see. It looks like they did it in the, at this green step right here. So right here they had five, two, right? Five comma two. And we said he better get twice as tall. What did five turn into? Did he get twice as tall? 
tall is the y value, right? Height is based on y, or if you want to say distance from the y axis or x axis, turned into 5'4. So he got twice as tall if he's standing in the same spot. Was that true for every single position? Look at 3's comma 0. Did he get twice as tall? What's 0 times 2? So he did get twice as tall, even though it doesn't, it's a little wonky. So that's kind of a, I like looking at that, even though it's really ugly when they put all four on the same graph, because you can slow down and look at each one and see how it affected it. All right, now we get to do it. Um, if you go and you're studying the book, because all of you do that after class, you go home, you take the notes that we did, you're working on your homework, and then you read through the textbook and the chapter in the textbook that aligns perfectly with what we did in class. Uh, the book didn't have the graph. This was just such a short section that I was like, okay, we're graphing it as well. The book just said, so if you go and look at try it two in the book, it's just going to say write the equation. So let's start with that instead of starting with the graph. Well, before we write it, I'm going to write f of x equals what's the most basic toolkit parent absolute value function? Boom, 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 right? And now I'm going to change it to g of x, and we're going to do what to it? Which way? OK, two units to the left. Right? So that looks like x plus 2 on the inside. Vertically shifted. Plus 3 on the outside. And now the hard part. It's not that hard. Vertically reflected? On the outside, right? So, which one do we... I think we're going to do the reflection first, huh? I guess. Were you all in the, was it this class or was it the second class that I learned I can do this? Y'all see me do this yet? That's pretty cool, huh? That's pretty sweet. Yeah. If you're asking me, I'm pretty excited about that situation right there. All right. Uh, so we got that's the normal thing, right? So I'm going to reflect it. Watch me change this color so fast. Actually, uh, I don't know. Well, I was thinking now it's not matching the colors above, but that's okay. Y'all cool with that vertical reflection right there? Reflection? Then what? Did I? Are you sure? No comment. Uh, move it two to the left. Cool. And then what? Every time I click on that tool thing, it opens up that menu. It's kind of annoying. Maybe there's a way to stop it next. Move it up three. I know this is a lot of, that was not a good one. What? Oh, that's really close to the original. Dang it. There we go. So we went reflection. And then in the green, we went over two. And then in the orange, we went up three. Not too bad. Hopefully not. It's not meant to be. All right. Last thing is uh, solving these absolute values, which um, I think is just probably the easiest on a piecewise, but we'll see. There's a couple ways. Uh, I did. The, was anybody in my class last year when we talked about uh, solving an absolute value and how to get 
get rid of the absolute value? Yeah, yeah. All right, so. Um, first off, they're doing something cool, like foreshadowing what we're about to do in days to come. They're doing a real cool thing right here. Anybody got an idea of what they're doing? Like foreshadowing? If what? Solve for x if what? Sure, those are the words. Why is that cool? Those are the words you just said. That's cool. Why is that a cool thing to do? It's a zero or a a root or a not necessarily, but often. <laughs> um, X intercept. There's one more. Nobody ever remembers the word solution. If you want to remember rocks, you can. Root, zero, x, solution. Rocks. That's what they're having us find. So if we were to graph it, we could just go and look for the x-intercepts and be done, done. But um, they're going to ask us to solve it. We'll go ahead and do it. Uh, so it says f of x equals the absolute value of 2x minus 1 minus 3. And they're saying f of x isn't f of x. What is f of x actually? 0. Good to note that they're not plugging it in. Right? They are setting it equal to. They're not plugging it in. They're setting it equal to. 0 is not x. 0 is y. 0 is the output. They're asking us, what is the input? And really, there's only one step that you, I guess two steps, technically. One's easy, one's hard. The first step is get the absolute value alone, just like you would any variable. Get that absolute value all by itself. And there's one thing keeping that from happening right now. But that's like the, old, that's like the major thing. If you can remember that, I think you're going to get the rest of it, because you'll just start tracking down the path. But if you can get that absolute value alone, you can solve this thing. So what's keeping that absolute value from being by itself? So you're just going to add 3 to both sides, yay? And we've got 3 equals brackets 2x minus 1. Okay. And this is what I like to do because it also helps us with inequalities. If you want to do it the way you've learned it, do it the way you've learned it. You don't have to copy me. I just like to think about a strand of statements where it also equals what? Negative 3. And that's how we're getting rid of that absolute value like that. It's, oh, look, it could equal the left or the right. Now, these are the same thing. I'm not telling you that 3 equals negative 3. I'm just giving you a dividing line down the middle of saying, hey, that equation is true and that equation is true. But because when we moved at inequalities, those little greater than, less than signs, and you do that to get rid of the absolute value sign, it works really, really nicely to see the strand of x in the middle, small number on one side, big number on the other. Um, so this yields us two, total, two different equations. So I really should get rid of that long line and say, now we've got two equations to solve, two different equations to solve. 2x two, two minus 1 equals 3 and... Indeed. And then you just solve it. Go to town. Solve away. 2x equals 4. x equals 2, right? And then 2x equals negative 2. x equals negative 1. Okay? Are you allowed to have two answers? Are you allowed to have two x-intercepts? Absolutely. Are you allowed to have two answers for your y value if you were plugging in an x? Not with, not and it still be a function. <laughs> Maybe a random question someday, but no. All right, um, we're going to be done so early. It's only 9.20, so, so much time. So let's go ahead and graph this. Uh, without even using our answers that we just got, let's just graph it straight up. Um, 
the normal thing, the normal absolute value. That is really annoying. Yep, just that normal thing like that, right? Okay. I might do a couple transforms at the same time just for fun. Oh, we got to be careful. Yeah, that's actually a pretty nasty problem right there. They're hitting us with a pretty mean problem. Just because of the horizontal shift not being by itself. So, let's see. X, Y. Let me just draw a table real quick to track what we're doing. If you plug in zero, what do you end up with? I don't think so. I don't think so. Zero spits out minus one, positive one, so minus two. Right? Because it spits out negative one, which turns into one. Okay, okay. So that is called, that's got a name too. Anybody remember? The y-intercept, lovely. Zero comma two. All right. Uh, what else we got? Oh my gosh! Terrible graphing. Uh, what about one? Two minus one is one. Minus three is ooh. That's interesting. What? I don't think that's right either. One? One minus three is negative two. Oh. What? Yeah. I mean, we're just being careful. Zero, right? Plugs in. You get a negative one. Flip it, you get a positive one. Minus three is negative two. That works. And then you plug in 1, you get 2 minus 1 is 1, minus 3 is negative 2. Oh, I think I know where the vertex is. Yeah, I don't know exactly what the y value is yet, but I bet I know the x value. Also, the vertical. Oh, horizontal. Mm hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's supposed to get half as uh, wide. Okay. Mm, I think we need two more points. You did two already. What'd you get for two? Should should be right. Okay, okay. Now we're tracking. But then we should know negative one as well, right? Is it also zero? All right, so I feel like to get this graph done, done, we just need that one more point. Now it's gonna be ugly. It's not gonna be a pretty thing, but you know what X value we definitely should plug in? Oh, you can do three, and that's pretty pretty. Three's going to be pretty. It'll end up with a good number, right? Because it's like six minus one is five. Five minus three is two. You could totally do three. I'm saying I feel like we have to do that ugly uh, line of symmetry just because it's there and it wants us to do it. It's calling for us. Which is also, uh, this is why I paused and went to the table instead of the uh, shifts because there's a really specific middle step that if you just start doing the shifts, it's the thing that I messed up on while we were doing the class the other day when I screwed up on, uh, the, I did the middle of the three steps and then we said, cross that middle step out. It's exactly like the scary part is, if you see a problem like this, there's a big step you have to do first. And we're about to see it happen right here and get us our line of symmetry. Um, so let's keep going. One half, last but not least. 
the hard one. If you plug in f of 1 half, I don't know, I haven't, I haven't done it yet. 2 times 1 half is 1, minus 1 is 0, negative 3. Oh, how nice and neat of them. Right there. And then from there, I think you're safe to just draw your lines. Use your, okay, does this have a thing that says don't show me anymore? Nope. They're just trying to sell me on the. So it definitely got an error. It definitely shifted down, and it definitely shifted to the right. But here's why I wanted to do that. Is did it shift to the right what maybe initially we would have thought it would have? How much did it shift to the right? Half. And how much did maybe our brains, even if somebody in the MI or somebody would have said, no, I know how much it shifted to the right. How much does it feel like it maybe could have shifted to the right? It does, right? Even to me, on that other day, when I messed up. I am not ever going to say I'm not going to make mistakes. I often make mistakes. I appreciate help when I do. Feels like it could be one, right? But there's that one step that you have to do before you can uh, do any graphing, and it's to take that shift, if it's on the inside, outside doesn't matter, and to reverse distribute it, right? And if you take it out of one side, you gotta reverse distribute out of both terms. It's just like the division thing we were doing a second ago, but with multiplication. So now we've got, before we can graph, if we were just gonna graph straight up, it doesn't come, I actually should have drawn that better. It's not going outside of the absolute value. It's just going in front of a new parentheses. Or if you take two out of x, you've got a two, or two out of two x, you've got x. And if you take two out of one, what are you left with? And there's your horizontal shift getting the pop up. Real pretty like. So there's a horizontal shift of one half, a vertical shift of three, and a ver horizontal stretch. No. Opposite of what you would think. Horizontal compression, one half as wide. Or twice as thin, whatever, however you want to think about it. One half as near. Or, yeah. Can you tell me a good way to describe um, the A and B of, say, Sure. So Please. A is vertical, and so it affects rise. B is horizontal, so it affects run. This, I'm going to write the equation first, because you're right. A parentheses, B, X plus C plus D. Um, f of x, because it's a function, those are all the shifts. Because a is a vertical stretch, it affects the rise, right? Which is, I'm going to go ahead and add a y there, just for fun. And you're saying because b is the horizontal, it affects run, and I'm going to add an x there. And then even further to sturdy up, it's on the inside, isn't it? And we've always said that inside turns into horizontal. And we've always said that outside turns into vertical, right? So that's just to sturdy up what you said. Because it's vertical. Because it's on the outside, it's vertical. And because it's vertical, it's rise it, taller or shorter. And then you have to still think flip-floppy for the inside one. Like, ooh, it's running, but it's actually getting skinnier. Zoom out real quick.